right. Well, if it's okay, let's uh, get started. So um, we should do our opening prayers. So uh, for this evening, uh, Tom, will you uh, recite the opening prayers for us, please? Certainly. <clears throat> the altruistic motivation. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path, liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I will establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path, liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly I'll establish them in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. Dong la, dong war, je pe dra, no par, je pe ge. Thar pa, dong, tam che, ken pe, bar du, cho par, je pa, tam che, kiso, je pe. Ma nam ka dang yam pe sam chen tam che de wa dang den. Dung ya dang dro nyer du la na me pa yang dang par zok pe chang chu grim po che thal par sha. The Action Bodhicitta Prayer. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until time, now from now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. De che du sang ma ge ki bar du lugang yi sum ge wala ko. Ma she bar du lugang yi sum ge wala ko. Du de ring ne sung te ni ma sang da sam gi bar du lugang yi sum ge wala ko. Long Refuge Prayer. We take refuge in the kind root lama and the lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities and the mandalas of Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dhaka, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. We take refuge in the kind root lama and the lineage lamas. We take refuge in the deities and the mandalas of Yadams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dhaka, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the eye of wisdom. Trinchen Sawadang Girpar Jepe Palen Lama Dampa Namla Kayok Suchio Yedam Kilkorgi Lak Shung Namla Kayok Suchio Sangje Chumden De Namla Kayok Suchio Dampe Chonamla Kayok Suchio Pakpe Jendung Namla Kayok Suchio Pao Kandro Choyok Sume Sogeshiki Chendang den pa nam la kayok so chiyo. Taking the Bodhisattva vow. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path. I, too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the bodhisattva's path, I, too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to bodhicitta, and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Chang chu ming por chikibar, sangje nam la kayok so chi. 
Chodang Chang Chug Senpei Shoglayang Deshin Kayopsuchi Jetar Gongi De Sheki Chang Chug Dungi Ke Padang Chang Chu Senpei La Pala Dedang Rimshin Nepata Deshin Drola Pendang Du Chang Chu Semni Ki Ising Duzin Duni La Pala Rempar Shindu La Par Gio short refuge prayer. And the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. But a merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. And the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. But a merit of generosity and other good deeds, May I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangje Chodang Soki Chong Nam La Changchu Bardu Dangi Kayok Sochi Dangi Jinso Jipe Sonam Ki Drola Penshur Samge Drupar The four measurables. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness in the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachments and aversions. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachments and aversions. Manam kadang yampe samchen tamche de wadang dewe gyurdang den par jurshi. Dungya dang dungya gi yu dang dra war jurshi. Dungya me pe de wa dang mi dra war jurshi. Ne ring chak dang yu dang dra way tang yom la ne par jurshi. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so. Uh, we were working on the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. What we've been establishing has been a routine for a daily practice. So we would begin with the opening prayers like we just recited. And then we would go into the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma to recite them. This is the preliminary foundation awakening. So if you all have this text, so can I ask, uh, someone to read this. I presume everybody has their copy of it handy. So um, who would, uh, Ed Jones, can I ask you, uh, do you have your copy? Would you uh, mind reciting this uh, for everybody? Are we talking about Buddhism? What are we talking about? What? We're talking about this. The, oh, this, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So start with the precious human life and continue on. The freedoms and advantages so extremely difficult to obtain accomplish the purpose of human life. If one does not achieve benefit from this now, how could this opportunity come again? Ho, oh, this kind of leisure and endowment is supremely difficult to obtain. When one obtains a body, which is easily lost, do not waste it meaninglessly, but rather use it to attain ultimate liberation, joyous result. So now we contemplate for, for a couple minutes or so, contemplate on the meaning of precious human life. You may read this quietly to yourself, but the contemplation is an important part of this recitation.
Please continue. Ah, no matter what has been done, nothing benefits at the time of death. Worldly activities? Yes, they are lies. Ka, the eight worldly dharmas are like a painted rainbow. Think you can put your trust in them? In the certainty of death and knowing that nothing remains long, quickly accomplish liberation. Impermanence makes departure certain, like the shadow of the setting sun. Abandoning laziness and indifference blaze like fire in fierce diligence. This life is impermanent, like clouds in the autumn sky. Birth and death migrators are the same, like actors in a play or dance. Next page, please. The life of beings is like lightning in the sky, like water falling from a steep mountain cliff. It departs quickly, quickly. The nature of all phenomena is impermanence. Death is a certainty to all who are born. Death can descend any time, like a drop of morning dew on a blade of grass. Quick, it is time to make effort for the essence of the Dharma. Contemplate the meaning of impermanence. We read this quietly to yourself. Contemplate. Marks, please. The suffering of samsara. Consider the suffering of beings in the six realms of samsara. Doing so, great fear and dread arise in the heart. In the three lower realms and even in the three higher ones, there is not an instant of absolute happiness. I will avoid the root cause of my samsaric existence and practice the excellent path of peace to enlightenment. So contemplate the suffering of samsara. Read this to yourself. You can read the, the finer print here where it talks about human suffering, the three sufferings, the all-pervading suffering, the suffering of change, and the suffering of suffering. And then we can also contemplate the meaning of the six human realms, the Deva realm, the God realm, the demigod realm, the human realm, the three lower realms are the animal realm and the hungry ghost realm and the hell being realm. So contemplate the suffering of samsara.
please continue. Karma. Even if one were a king at the time of death, one's possessions, enjoyments, friends, and retinue will not follow. But whatever that sentiment being, but wherever that sentiment being goes, his karma follows after him like a shadow. shadow. The fruit of one's positive karma is happiness. Suffering is the fruit of negative karma. The inexorable karmic causation is the mode of abiding in all dharmas. Henceforth, practice the dharma by distinguishing what should be practiced and what should be given up. So contemplate karma, cause, and result. By reading this, reflecting on your experience with karma, cause, and effect. Okay, so we left off talking last time uh, with the suffering of samsara. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about karma, cause and result, this last part of the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. So before I do, before we go there, does anybody have any questions or comments regarding the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma? And Ed J, I will do everything. Um, I will check and see if I have your mailing address and, and send you the uh, a copy of these four thoughts and also the uh, the one on one book that we use, the, the prayer book that we use. I will send you a copy of that. So sorry, I haven't done that yet. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Last, yes, sir. Uh, I've said this before, but I, uh, I'll repeat it because uh, uh, it's important to me. Um, I have these on my bedside table uh, and I read them the first thing when I get up in the morning. Now, sadly, that doesn't mean that my activities, and my demeanor for the rest of the day reflect the fact that I have read them first thing in the morning. But it's always a good start, and it uh, teaches me to, at some point during the day, to go back to them in my head, or if necessary, just to go back and read them again. But I think it's an excellent way to begin the day, because you began the day with that thought in your head. Or those That's thoughts. Good. Those yeah, very good. Thank you. How, how, how uh, you know, these past three weeks or two weeks, whatever it's been, you know, and we haven't been connecting in this way. Um, did did you kind of take a vacation away from Dharma, or did it give you an opportunity to 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 engage with self self motivation? 
I had a lot of opportunity because of the challenges. We're moving. Oh. And uh, to Loudoun County, uh, I've been persuaded to do that. I put up a good fight, but I, I, I lost as is my custom. But uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. But then, then there is samsara, there is the world, which has really been with us. And uh, dealing with, uh, and I've had this discussion with uh, uh, other, other people, other Buddhists beyond our community, is how do you deal with frustration, anger, and anxiety and anguish uh, as, as you watch the world turn around you? So that can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing to make you uh, uh, turn your mind back to the four thoughts and, the, and, and to other tenets of the practice uh, because you're challenged every day to be angry and to, um, to, uh, to judge people. And uh, you have to remind yourself that, uh, that, that, that that is not your place to do. That uh, you've got to really believe in karma. You know, it's really hard to believe in karma sometimes that you don't have to personally mete out justice and right every wrong. The karma really does visit us all as, as, as individuals and as groups. And uh, for me in my personal life and dealing with all the vicissitudes of preparing to move in the fall uh, and life being what it is these days, it's been a good challenge. And the four thoughts are, are really a core. They're really, really a core. Okay, great. So the Dharma has helped you. This practice has helped you to uh, keep a, a balance and understanding. Is that is that fair to say? It brings you back to center. It's not that you don't make mistakes. It's not that you don't get angry. It's not that you don't judge people and do all the things that we don't want to do. But you, it, it gives you an awareness I don't know, at least it gives you, I shouldn't speak for everyone, it gives me an awareness that um, I have a lot of work to do. And, um, and, and instead of justifying uh, and becoming righteous in my anger or in my frustration, I understand that it's doing me and others more harm instead of good. Okay. Ed, how about you? You know, in, in these past couple of weeks, have you had an opportunity to reflect on the Dharma talks that we've had? Ed Jones? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I don't... I haven't, I haven't had particular sessions at particular times where I have done that, but I've done it in a kind of ongoing way, I think, um, um, more holistically than specifically. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's made a difference, not, not perhaps the difference that I would like for it to have made, but, but some difference. Um, what do you mean that it hasn't made a difference that you would like it to make? What does that mean? I don't know, but I, I think I would expect at this point to be I don't know, more 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 enveloped by Buddhism than I probably am, but that that has to do with what I put into it, which probably isn't enough. I know it isn't enough. Has there been any benefit at all in in the Dharma that we've talked about and so on? Have you have you seen an influence in your life in some way? Yeah, I think so. And the kind of the I really was interested in what Gary was just speaking about in terms of uh, you still 
and, and, and I don't know that I can reflect him accurately, but you, you still do the things. I mean, you still have judgments. You still, you still uh, uh, have your own ideas of what wrongs ought to be righted and what you ought to, what you ought to do about that. Um, you still have righteous indignation, but somehow it's somehow I find that um, I find my periods of that are less acute and my re and my recovery from it is, is is quicker and I get back to the I get back to a baseline I, I, and then I depart from it again, but I get back to it better than I used to. Um, I'm not. I'm not where Gary is. I'm not. A, I'm not that kind of. Not that kind of systematic. But, um, but I do think there's a difference. Yeah. What was your, what was your sense of spirituality before you started with this, and and where is it now? Is there is there something you can track to that? Can you see spirituality in that way? I don't know that my sense that my sense of spirituality is any different, but I but I'm in touch with it more. Um, I know spirituality to me is kind of like is kind of like logging on to something greater than myself, and I had, and I'm not always able to do that. But I may be more able to do it now more often than I was before. I, I don't know that my sense of what spirituality is has changed. Um, but I'm, yeah, I, I think I'm in touch with it more. But I got a long way to go. I got a really long way to go. Well, do you feel, I mean, is, is it, um... You know, I know you're a good person. I know you're a spiritual person. And, you know, uh, you know, the question is, is, is the Buddhism providing something for you? Uh, you know, Buddhism is not exclusive. You know, you can, you can right. derive these benefits in other, from other ways, other systems and so on. So, but, but there is a, but there is something about Buddhism. And I'm wondering if, if you feel that there's some connection there and you want to deepen that connection. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to become a Buddhist for the sake of becoming a Buddhist. Uh, but I, I, I do think that this, this just very minimal experience that I've had with Buddhism uh, it has helped me uh, connect to to a to a larger perspective. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense, Lance. You get <laughs> no, you you are. That's good. You know, and and part of it is just you know to to get ourselves to speak and and uh, you know enter into a discussion and hear ourselves think about things. Mm -hmm. You know, developing some critical thought about, you know, what's going on in our lives. Sometimes it's it's just easy just to let these things come in and go, and they don't get really processed very much. But uh, when we have to comment on these things, it gives us cause to to stop a minute and to say, oh, well, what what is happening with me? What am I doing? I, I have not become a committed Buddhist, but I I I I have valued uh, my exposure to. To what to what you and this group has provided. Okay, and, and and just to make the point, I've said this many times. Just if you if you do feel like you know you can call yourself a Buddhist, it doesn't preclude your becoming to being a Christian, or to oh, becoming a Jew, or to becoming a Hindu, or oh, or you. a Muslim, or anything like that. We can be all these things at the same time, and we are. You know, it's just a different way of. Of, of expressing, of looking at what that means, that spirituality. You, you emphasized that in the first, first several sessions that I attended, and that was, 
that was, uh, that made me want to do more. Okay, good. Would anybody like to comment on anything that we've just talked about? Uh, I would like to just uh, make a, a comment related to my own personal uh, issues. So uh, recently, my health has been not that great in the sense that I have been having a shoulder, a frozen shoulder. I had a frozen shoulder on my uh, right hand, like several years back. Uh, it's healed now. And now I'm having the, uh, the left hand shoulder, a frozen shoulder. Uh, so some of doctors say it's also called like a short shoulder nerve uh, uh, inflammations. So yeah, so this uh, uh, physical issue has kind of uh, restricted my physical activity. Sometimes it is very frustrating. So the other day I have a friend's house, we were talking and one of my friends says something that kind of uh, stick me with me. He said, uh, your, mm, uh, your frozen shoulder is a, uh, is a, a body response that something is not uh, uh, right. Something is not, uh, you know, getting right. So I also thought like, if, if I can connect that to my own spirituality or my practice. So yes, so frozen shoulder is a response to my own uh, uh, response to the, how my physical well-being is going. So will there be any kind of a uh, spiritual response or anything like uh, in terms of Dharma that would kind of alert me or awake me that now it is time for me to do something? Uh, even though uh, I, am, I, I know the benefit that I'm gaining from spiritual, you know, spiritual practice, Dharma practice, but at the same time, due to time constraints, I'm unable to commit it to 100% time and so on. So my question is like, like the body, you have a response that I am still, you know, going through injuring the uh, phys uh, body response to some, to my health issues. Will there be any like uh, external or any other spiritual or like uh, uh, a response to how, you know, how I should mm, practice? Uh, dharma or so on. Yeah, that's a really, really good question, and and we've 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 talked about this a number of times over the years and so on. And the uh, the first thing that we have to recognize is that we have three bodies. We've got our physical body, and we've got our intellectual body, and most people only deal with their physical body and their intellectual body. But we also have a spiritual body, and that spiritual body is a is is an integral part of who we are. When we are just thinking about our physical body and thinking about our intellectualism, that those two kind of can can sometimes conflict with each other, and they can show signs of psychosomatic illness. When we get emotionally upset, or we get you know, frustrated or we're getting uh, overworked or something like that, it can have a, an effect on our physical body. And it takes a lot of work for us to be able to, to recognize that and to be able to balance it out and so on, to be able to recognize that that conflict is going on and that we're developing these psychosomatic illnesses or we become prone to injuries and so on because we're not really paying attention. We're not mindful of what we're doing and an accident happens. And then we have to suffer through whatever consequences that will have. But when we realize that we have a spiritual body, the spiritual body has a way of tempering the intellectual, of being able to put it into a, into a rest mode that's very easy, that's very comfortable, and we can see the agitation that our intellectualism is going through, that our thoughts, our emotions are going through. So it gives us a, a rest period. By doing that, then our physical body begins to relax too. 
if we can engage our physical body along with our intellectualism to ignite our awareness of the spirituality, now we're using all three bodies together for a, a balance. We're, we're forming a balance. So the, I always use the, the expression of a, of a three-legged stool will sit by itself. But if you have a two-legged stool, it won't balance by itself. But if you got three legs, it will. So we're trying to find that balance. And then we find that, that now we can rest more comfortably. The, um, the antagonism of our intellectual pressures begin to, to go away and so on. So the question of how we engage this now becomes important. What we're doing now, what we're going through now is an intellectual process. There's not a lot of physicality in what we're doing. We are talking about spirituality, but we're not really stretching. We're not really making the spirituality body do any work at this point. But it's an it's a intellectual investigation. When we take this investigation and put it into practice. When we do what we would call Dharma practice, what we are doing, we are engaging our physical body. How are we doing that? Well, we're sitting in a particular position and then we are reciting these prayers and mantras. Yes, Dorja, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting in it so that's making sense to you yes so so i'll just finish by saying that that the 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 practice of engaging our physical body through the recitation we're using our lungs we're using our voice we're saying things we are engaging intellectually in what we are learning here with these different practices and the meanings of them and so on and they are like a key that fits into a lock that opens up our spirituality, that opens up our heart. And then we become a complete human being. We become more rested. We become more natural. And then those conflicts within our physical body and intellect and so on begin to, uh, to rest also and to become um, calm and we become a, a, a happier person and so on. So that's a really good question. And so, you know, and I've, we've been saying this over and over again, the practice is the most important thing. And, uh, and we're hoping that now we can go back into Dharma Surya and that the power of being able to come together as a Sangha, as a community, as a group of brothers and sisters, to come together to support our practice together becomes invaluable. Because if we say we're going to do this on Zoom, it, it loses something. But when you're in the same room together, then you know that energy is, is coming all together and we begin to support each other in a spiritual way, in a physical way, and an intellectual way, because we can ask each other questions, we can see each other, and we get that support. So that's the next thing that we really got to work on is, uh, is uh, coming together on maybe Saturdays, uh, saying Saturday will be our, our practice day. We can come to Dharma Surya and we can uh, do practice together. Maybe you want to do it for an hour or two. Maybe you want to do it for the whole day. But the goal would be to be available all day and that whatever you can partake in, you'll see that it will begin to uh, grow on its own accord. You'll enjoy it very much and you'll begin to be able to see the, the benefits of doing that together. So thank you. Ed, Jay, would you like to comment on any of this? Because uh, I know you don't have the book or the text or anything, but, but just listening to us and so on, uh, do you have a sense of something that you'd like to say? Um, yes, um, definitely. Thank you for this. Um, I call myself a, a, a Christian mystic and Kabbalist. Um, 
um, I know a little bit about um, Christianity and Are you still there, Ed? We're not hearing you. Size. Then eight years ago, I had a I had an actual experience. Okay. Of, of um, um, I had an actual experience of we call it spirit. We call it um, um, energy from a scientific standpoint. Um, where what we call Kundalini, yeah. basically, I had I had that that um, I had that event that occurred um, um, April fourth exactly um, eight years ago, and um, and then just just for my curiosity to explore to try to understand cosmology, how things work in general, how things work from a spiritual standpoint from a scientist um, um, scientific standpoint, then you say something that's really um, key that everything is integrated. Everything is, um, it's universal. Where there's the, uh, the Hinduism, Catholicism, um, Christianity in general, Buddhism, you know, all that stuff. It's um, all these things stem from, you know, the, what we could, you know, call them cosmic law, right? And um, when somebody really go beyond the um, the the um, intellectual conceptualization to the practice, and you'll see that basically every every religion, so to speak, is seeking for the same. And um, and the what I have experienced, and I can speak like this for. Um, I, I did Vipassana and it turned out that from doing that compared to, um, for example, um, five years ago, I did a 42 days with, with, with no food. I was just drinking water for 42 days. It was a little hard. And, um, um, because this is, you know, these are things that I've read, you know, from the Bible that, you know, Jesus, um, the enlightened one from the Christian religion, he fasted for 40 days. I said, you know, I'm going to try to do 41. And <laughs> I ended up doing 42 days. And the commonality that I see is that they're saying the same thing. They're saying this exactly the same thing. The practice, the, the practice is really the same. There's a part where it says uh, Vipassana is just some, is just, for example, just really observing, do good, right? Do good, be truthful, be aware of from a deeper level of observing the sensation within your body. Because I think um, the um, the gentleman who just left um, mentioned about some, you know, some um, some type of um, pressure that he's feeling on his his, his shoulder, right? And so exactly what you said, Les, that um, that everything, the religion and it's, it, everything is really related. And it's, um, when we say spirituality, it's subjective to one's experience, right? But at the same time, whether, whether a person recognizes himself or herself as an atheist, that person still in some regards experience spirituality. And it's just the, uh, the, um, the nomenclature or the, the, uh, the wording or the semantic, if you will. Um, so that's, um, cause I see, you know, from, I think this is my second session here or the third session. And I just see that from what you, you are, for what's being read from, from the discussion. And I, I really see that the, um, the commonality from my own um, experience of, um, you know, 25 years of, you know, studying the Bible and then actually not just so much studying, but actually to experience. And, and that's where the, um, the wisdom of insight that the, um, that, um, that Vipassana is, 
where somebody really, once you have that experience now from that experience, one can speak as so um, from the standpoint of wisdom of insight. So that's- yeah, from, um, from your personal experience. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lance, I, I don't know what you're, how, how you need to uh, navigate time here, but do, do we have time for Ed to describe the experience he had eight years ago on April the 4th? Sure. Would you like to describe, would you like to talk more about that, Ed? Mm -hmm. Sure, please. Yes. Yes. So I found myself where um, I was in New York and, and there was something happened in, in, in 2012. Something happened in 2012. And in, in your personal life? In my personal life, yes. Um, you know, I was an executive in the area of um, finance, um, school administration, and and from there, I just felt like I had no desire whatsoever to to um, to um, to continue in that mode. I wanted to do. I wanted to explore something. I felt like there was something more. Okay, and and. I ended up in Texas. And interestingly, Texas is a desert, Dallas, um, in, uh, specifically in Dallas. And so I went, cause I was there from October to about April. And then April, and during that time, cause I have a family, I have a wife and three kids. And um, while I was in Texas, it was on a Friday, going from the third into the fourth, with the fourth was on a Saturday. And for whatever reason, every day I would speak with my wife. Every day I would call her, we would talk. Um, when the kids are going to sleep, we'll pray with them, you know, things like this, put them to sleep. But that Friday, I did not talk to her. Okay. And, um, and her mother and her sister came to the house in New York. Mind you, I'm in Texas. And my wife said to her family, to her, her mother and sister, I'm gonna have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, okay? Or I'm gonna have an encounter to that, which we call the Christ. Christ means anointing, right? And they look at her like she's crazy, okay? So meanwhile, I'm in Texas, 1600 miles away from, 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 from New York. So um, what I did during that time I was there, I was just fasting. All I did was read the Bible and fast read the Bible and fast. Interestingly, when I was reading the, the Bible, I did not believe, quote unquote, believe in God, whatever we call God. We call God, I said the creator, right? When we say God, what is God? Or who is God? We say is the creator. So I did, I believe in the creator, but I did not believe in the stories in the Bible because it did not make sense to me, okay? I'm, I'm a very logical um, scientific guy. So, but for years, I just kept reading the Bible. People think I went to church. I pray for people, people receive healing. I didn't even believe in it. Right. So, so that Friday, all I did was meditate. You know, I would read the Bible and meditate, read the Bible and meditate, meditate, meaning just like sit down and not talking, not even praying. Okay. And then around from Friday night, into Saturday at around three o'clock, I was sleeping and I felt something entered into my head. And it began to speak a very loud, he's begin to speak very loudly. So we call that speaking in tongues, right? But the voice that I was hearing, it feels like he fills the entire universe. In other words, wherever, where like, I feel like you could hear it anywhere that you are in the world, very loud. And I'm able to understand it. I, un I understood it in that language. I understood it in Creole, in French and in English, because I do speak those languages, right? And he began to speak with me. So I, I kind of panic. I'm like, if you are the demons, you know, some devil, I don't want to talk to you. So back off. And he's like, no, this is who I am. But in that heavenly language, though. This is who I am. I'm the maker of the heaven and the earth. This is the power that I have. So it's talking to me like this. And then after a while, but meanwhile, my eyes are closed. My eyes are closed and my body, this thing is happening, but my body is just lifting up the, the, the bed. I mean, actually bouncing off the bed. And 
it felt like it felt like I was dying. And it felt like I was dying because it was like a, I never experienced anything like that. But at the same time, I felt this power. I felt this power of covering. That's the only way I could describe it. And then from covering, there, covering, 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 like um, like there was like a shield around me. Okay. Yeah, like a protective um shield, if you will. That's what I felt, right? And then, then from there, then my body stopped bouncing off the bed. Then I begin to act to I begin having conversation just as we are back and forth. And then I'm speaking, I'm speaking, and it's answering my questions back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then after that, it says, This is the encounter that Saul had with me on his way to Damascus. Damascus means city in the brain, right? Because the Bible is after the um, like a pattern of the brain, right? And then from there, that thing left, left my, my head, right? And then and then now I'm up. I pick up the phone. I pick up the phone. And my wife said, then, don't tell me. Don't tell me you had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I was like, what? I'm like, how would you know? She was like, call my mother. She'll tell you. So this woman was able to see that I would have an encounter. Mind you, I didn't even believe in that. You know, during that time, I didn't believe in, they said Jesus and uh I know it was not literal. I know there was some type of like literary to it, right? But I just did not believe it until that encounter. So in short, basically that was the extent of the encounter. Now, when I got back to New York, when I got back to New York, as I was sleeping, something came and speak with me and said to me, the power that Moses had, I'm gonna give it to you. I'm like, what? And he repeated. Because the way that I know like an angel or like a higher being is speaking with me, he talked to me twice. He'll repeat the thing. He says, you know what? The power that Moses had, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm like, what? What kind of power is that? You know, I begin to question that. And then three or five days later, as I'm sleeping again, he says, did I tell you the power that Moses had? I'm going to give it to you. And he says, here it is. I saw myself. I know when I'm dreaming and I know when I'm having a vision, okay? I saw myself like kneeling in front of person, dressing as you are, Lance. But I could not see the person's face. It looks like he was a sage. I could not see the person's face. And he says, here's the power. If it looks like it was lightning, like electricity coming from that person entering into my body. It happened, he says, here it is, here it is, here it is. And then as soon as I say, I receive, then the person disappeared. After that day, if I go pick up the Bible, I'm able to understand it. Whether it's literally, I could explain it to somebody. I could explain it to somebody literary, from a literary standpoint. I could explain it to that person from a psychological standpoint. And from a practical standpoint on how to apply it. So that's, um, it's weird for somebody who's a scientist, you know, but at the same time, it is what it is. You know, that's my experience. Thank you very much. That, that was really great. You did, you did that very well. You said that very well. And, and um, does anybody have any uh, questions or comments that you'd like to open up with that? Ed, you, you brought it up. What do you think? I'm glad I brought it up. <laughs> I, I <don't> know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. Uh, it's beyond the my realm of experience. Um, that's why I wanted to hear about it. Now, uh, there was a word used uh, not before that, uh, Ed, uh, Kundalini or something like that. Kabbalah. And the Kundalini. 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 What, what does that mean? Ed, will you want you want to explain that? No, for sure. Yes, Kundalini. It's it's an energy. Is that sacral energy we we have within our bodies? It's a it's a Hindu practice. 
It's a Hindu practice, but it's at the same Hindu time, practice. it's a Hindu practice. But at the same time, when 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 like the Christian people say, like the Holy Ghost, like you see people like shaking, vibrating, speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. that's a form of Kundalini. What it is within your sacral area, right? Your productive, within your productive area. So you have this energy that provides for creation. That's a you know, men and when men have babies, right? So that oil, right, that fluid within that sacral area, when it's um, when you sit down, when you sit down and you're vibrating, you're, you, you're vibrating that that energy, that area, right, your sacral area, then that oil ascends to the spine. Once it ascends to the spine and it reaches the brain, once it reaches the brain, basically it provides for when they talk about like the third eye, the um, the 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 midbrain activation, you know that you know that type of thing. So basically, what happens that oil ascends, it goes up the spine, and how do you know it's happening? Because you literally feels like your spine is getting hot. Okay, your spine is getting hot, your back is getting hot, and then and then from there, then you could literally feel something happening within your brain. So Kundalini. Is um is that is that energy that stays dormant within within a person? Some people force it to be awakened, but at the same time, in my case, it happened by accident. I cannot say it happened by accident. I did not do it on my own. It, it looks like it happened from again when when you meditate a lot, you know things like this. It, it bound to happen, right, or one way or another. And and I also I mentioned Kabbalah. Kabbalah well, let me, means... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, before you go <laughs> there. Uh, yeah. Let me let me comment on the on the Kundalini. Mm -hmm. it, sure. is, it is a practice, it's a Hindu practice, and it goes through the chakras. I think they say what there's seven chakras or nine chakras. Yes, yeah, seven. And it starts, it starts at the at the base, it starts right below the anus and works through all the way through the chakras and so on. And it, it is that energy that Ed is speaking about and so on and is very profound. And, and there's a practice that I would like to share with you all sometime, but we would have to do it together, you know, uh, uh, in the shrine room or, you know, someone who's had the experience, Ed could do it on Zoom with us, you know, but, um, but it's, a, it's a very profound practice that is very, very good. So having said that, now you can go to the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm, sure. And, um, you know, quickly, Kabbalah, the word Kabbalah. Means wait, 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 let, me, let me add one more thing, because it's important to say that Buddhism came out of Hinduism. Correct. In the same way that Christianity came out of Judaism. Exactly. Yes. So mm -hmm. many of the practices that were in the formation, you know, in the formative stages and, and the earlier uh, traditions then got you could say refined or purified or or built upon in different ways by the succeeding practices of buddhism and by christianity exactly so now exactly. kabbalism is part of the of the hebrew of the judaism so now you can go and talk about that mm -hmm, sure just quickly that every religion there's a fundamental part that everybody knows and practice and there's the mystical part, or there's the hidden part, or the occultic part. Occult means hidden, right? So in, um, in Christianity, it's called mystic. So I call myself like a, 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 a Christian mystic who practices Kabbalah, okay? And I know about Kabbalah because I practice Judaism also, okay? Because Christianity comes from Judaism, right? So Kabbalah, the word Kabbalah means kibel. Kibel means to receive. When you receive what I receive, there's an anointing, that Kundalini from, from having open like the seal within my body. So basically there's an anointing, there's, there's a, a quote, an enlightened, because sometimes I'm able to see light. I'm able to see like things when I, Actually, Lenz talk, touched upon that earlier. When you slow down your breath, when you slow down your breath, right? Then from there, you begin to experience 
truly who you really are. We, you may not understand it. Once you begin, to, when you go into a meditative um, state, you slow down your breath. And then now, even with your eyes closed, you can see light. You can see, for example, whatever we call spirits. These are like light or angle of light. We call them angels, but they're like angle of light or different arc of light that, that reflects within the brain that you begin to see it. So Kabbalah, which, are, which is like the mysticism of the, um, like mysticism, the word mysticism means like you can't really explain it, okay? It's above the physics. There's physics, there's like quantum physics, quantum mechanics, you know? So that's like above the physicality. So we call it mystery or mysticism because you can't really explain it because science cannot, because it's subjective as to that person's experience. All right. So Sufism is for the Islam and Islam is a Christian religion also. And um, Sufism is the is it, it's like mysticism, mysticism for for Christianity and Kabbalah is the mysticism for the for Judaism. And all these the people who practice the 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 hidden or the 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 mysticism of the of the part of that religion usually those people become, become, like the Buddha became enlightened in the light mentally. That's what the word enlightened mean. It means to be in the light mentally and to the practice, to the practice of refining the mind. And again, that happens to meditation. Very good, thank you again. Did anybody ever see the movie, the film, The Fifth Element? Yes. Remember that story? And that was a that was a characterization of the Kabbalah. Oh, I did not realize that. Yeah, you know, think about that. So, Ed, do you have any other uh, thoughts about this? You, Ed Jones. Ed Jones. Um. Not that I can put in the words right now. All right. So I think Ed Jay just really characterizes that all these things are interconnected and 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 you know they're just ways of different ways of expressing the same thing that is that is within us all that we call, you know, in Buddhism we talk about as our true nature. We call it Buddha. The Christians call it the Christ you know, and the different traditions have different names for it and so on, but it's all talking about that same indescribable essence that we all have. And when we can rest our physical body and use the energy that we would normally be fidgeting about with our physical body, when we can fast, like Ed was doing, that he fasts, so now his the, the energy that is digesting his food is now being used for something else and then the intellect the intellect gets focused you know when we're we're not being distracted by other things phone calls and business and and family things and everything so we're taking that that energy and that's coming with the physical energy and now we're bringing that together to open up our spirituality and then that opens up like i just said with we can see light, but it's not seeing light with our eyes. It's seeing light with our heart, our heart center. So all these things are, are characterizations of this experience. And when we begin to recognize these things, that's, that's the transformation. When we see that all these things are happening. Ed J, as you were doing this, was this stuff happening to you external to yourself? Or was it happening internally to yourself? Internal first. Correct. It was happening. And then, and then, and then you were able to relate now to all the phenomena, all the other nature all around you as seeing it all to be the same. That's right. Yes. And, and after a while, I mean, there were times that I literally feel, it feels weird because I'm very practical and like hands-on there were times where I feel like I'm part of like everything. It's like, I can't. Yeah. It, so this and, is the gift of life. This is the yeah, gift of life. Yeah. It's like, you can't move. It's like in that state, like somebody will come and see me 
it's like at which point I'm like, I'm part of like everything. It's like I see almost like everything like blends in. It, it, it's it's I can't it, like I said it, it's weird. And then, because, and then you made a you made a, a very important statement when you were first talking, and you said that when you were first experiencing this, you felt like you were going to die. Exactly. Yes. And literally, that's what you did. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That, that Ed J from before that time is gone. That's right. And now that yeah. Ed J that now has experienced this is forever changed. It's forever changed. And even the way that, even the way that, like, the way that I used to think, the way that I used to live, it's still there because those are conditioned. And I could tell you there's certain behaviors. I could not even engage in those behaviors, even if I wanted to. Some yeah. past behaviors, I can no longer, because this thing is like such a, because you are awakened, <laughs> you see, you are awakened. It's like the things that you, the things that were, the things that were pleasing, the things that were like almost like judgmental, it's almost like, okay. It's like, because you part of somebody who were, who was mean to you, you connected to that person. So even if you want to do wrong to that person, there's something in you from that experience where you're like, that person is just ignorant. That person is just adversive to himself or herself. Yeah. So would you consider yourself to be, did you experience this from the top down or from the bottom up? Or was it a combination of the two things? It's a combination because it was the spirituality where again so you understand was, you understand my question then. I think so. Would you would you explain expound expand? Well, from a top down would mean that it was something that you were open up to, and you yes. weren't you weren't trying to control it in any way, and it was just kind of manifesting as, as within you, without it, you having to manipulate it in any way. Exactly. And, and, but then and from it, the bottom up, we're, 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 we're conditioning ourselves, we're preparing ourselves, we're purifying ourselves to receive and to be able to recognize that experience when it happens. Okay. Um, it's a combination. It was both from, from, from the top and from the bottom, meaning from the standpoint, because I knew I, because one, because maybe maybe a year prior to that, maybe a year, two years prior to that, I said, there has to be more to life than this, than going to work, have a nice paycheck, has, you know, have a wife, a couple of kids, a dog, you know, things like this. And I said, there was more to life than this. So I begin to question that. And again, I was not an atheist, but I did not believe in whatever every, everyone else believed, like Jesus, this, you know, the way that they, it is being portrayed, I know I did not believe that. I would ask questions that could not answer me, that could not explain it. So I did, so I didn't understand it. All right. So let me ask you this now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As pertains to our conversation tonight. Yes. And when we talk about the four thoughts to turn the mind to the Dharma, mm -hmm. which is the Dharma is the teaching of the of the Buddha. That's right. Yeah. Could be the teaching of the Christ. Mm -hmm. Sure. The something. Teaching of, Mah of, of Mohammed or or whatever great leader of Moses, mm -hmm. whatever whatever spiritual leader, it's, it's the intellectualization of, of that experience and so on. So now with karma, do you, can you connect with the idea that there was a karma, there was a cause, there was an action that you had taken, maybe a series of actions over many, were in, in a timeless fashion mm -hmm. that yielded this result of this unequivocally, these experiences that you have had? Unequivocally, yes. Um, because I had a curiosity, right? I had a curiosity to, again, because I had said there had to be more to this life than just go to work, go to church, see the kids, play with the kids, go on vacation, you know, things like this. So there's certain behaviors that I begin to engage into I was purifying my mind. I did not realize that's what I was doing. Okay. Um, I was 
I became reflective and meditative, even though I did not, because the word meditation in, in the Christian in terms. terms. You didn't put it in those terms. Exactly. Like well, if we said, let's, let's say I said some other people to get into the conversation now. Mm -hmm, sure. Yeah. So, so um, does anybody want to speak about anything or have any questions? Zara, I know you always uh, have something good to say and, and you introduced uh, us to Ed. So we appreciate that. Do you have any comments you'd like to make? I, well, I've just been selfishly absorbing all this great dialogue from Kempo's frozen shoulder and your response to this engaging conversation between NJ and NJ. So I'm just, I'm in a point of just, I'm treasuring this dialogue privately as a listener. Um, I don't have anything really to comment. I'm just benefiting from listening to other people's wisdom right now. Thank you. You're welcome. Michael, how about you? Um, I'm uh, sort of speechless, which is probably appropriate. Okay. Gary? While I was listening, uh, and it, it, it may not be a clear analogy, I began to think of uh, the Apostle Paul's road to Damascus experience as characterized in the New Testament. Um, here was a man who, uh, uh, according to the Gospels, who was the biggest persecutor of early followers of Jesus. Um, a murderer. And on this journey, he had this transformative experience, which is characterized in the New Testament. And the most important thing about it, I think, is not the details of what happened as described, but the very idea that uh, this human being who is living life and viewing life in a particular way had uh, by himself on a lonely road, uh, inexplicably by the standards of human experience, a transformation which both frightened and gripped him and held him forever. And uh, whatever you might think of, uh, whatever some might think of Christianity and what has flown from it, uh, his life after that transformed that part of the world and the world in general. And so I guess my response is, I believe these experiences happen. I can't explain why. I think we try to explain why. Um, and uh, I think uh, Ed did and did a good job of it, but still, uh, these are, there's a, there, there's a dimension of us and our spirituality and our connection uh, with the universe that we don't understand, but that visits us, some of us. And uh, we can't ignore them. They follow us. Once they have, once, once they have gripped us, they stay with us. And we can't ignore them anymore. Okay, thank you. Tom, how about you? That was quite uh, humbling to hear that. That was very uh, well put and well said. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm speechless. Thank you so much. Okay. Anybody else like to make a comment? Ed, would you like to follow up with anything, Ed Jones? Oh, I think I'll join the speechless crowd. 
Okay. <laughs> All right, so bringing it back to, this, to the four thoughts that turn the mind to the Dharma. So you can see what, what now this experience that you have had vicariously through Ed J. Now you're forever changed. You can't take his, his discussion with us. We can't change it. We can't take that back. There has now been something that has awakened us to possibilities that maybe an hour or two ago we didn't realize that we're there. So Ed has given us a, a gift in this way, and it's changed us. So this is part of our karma, that we have prepared ourselves to be receiving this in this way. Maybe a year ago or two years ago, if we would have heard the same story, we might have been in the frame of mind where this just went in one ear and out the other, and more likely, it hit a block. It just hit a wall, and it couldn't penetrate any further than, than our eardrum for us to be able to fathom what is going on here, and you just turn it off. But because of our preparations, because of our conversations, our discussions, our teachings, and so on, and whatever practice we've done, we now have become a better vessel to be able to hold these possibilities within ourselves. And the, the thing about this is, is that because these are shared by so many different traditions and so on, they're all based as part of, of our human experience. And our human experience is a relative experience. Everything about it is relative. Everything about it is temporary. And all this are appearances. This stuff that was happening in Ed's mind, and that's where it was happening, in his mind, that opened up his heart. And the heart is the big mind, that which cannot be expressed. What was happening was his realization, his recognition of this through the brain, his interpretation of what was happening in the heart through his brain, through his conditioning. What had he been prepared for to be able to recognize this? How could he explain this? So in this way, we say that these are appearances. And we talk about in Buddhism all the time that everything is an illusion. Everything is just appearances. The mind is, is part of this, this emptiness of its own nature. But yet, you know, we hold on to these ideas. We fabricate these stories that go along with it that are trying to explain, explain or express something that is unexplainable. Would you agree with that, Ed, Jay? Yes, for sure. Very clearly said. So it's important to recognize this and to give ourselves the opportunity to do this. What was the key factor, I think, in this discussion was Ed's commitment to going on a fast, to going on a retreat, to getting out of town and being able to create this mindfulness for himself to stabilize this mindfulness, and then all this opened up. So this really becomes a testament to practice, that we can intellectualize things, but in, you can't intellectualize that experience. You have to experience that experience. Does that make sense? So that's what we want to do. That's what we're trying to do, to, to give you um, the opportunities, to give you the permission to do this. To change your mind. To change this mind that it thinks it knows everything and that it can know everything. Here, what Ed opened up to was something that was beyond comprehension. And that doesn't change. You know, it's still incomprehensible because it's, it's much greater than our human ability to be able to comprehend it, to be able to express it. But yet, there still is an experience. 
So let me ask Ed, what is, what is the, what is it that you have? What is the residual to that? What it's, is the um, result to that? Yeah, I mean, the result from this experience is the, um, you mentioned il illusion. You mentioned um, relativity, because everything is, is just really relative to that, um, to the extent of your experience, right? That um, then what it does, it, it, I'm just open to, there's an awareness that I have, right? I think the result, the clear result is the awareness being open. I'm open psychologically and I'm open emotionally. I don't know if I'm making sense. Psychologically from the standpoint where to be able to hear something, to be able to hear something, to conceptualize it, to intellectualize what's being said and shared and see. All right, well, let me I, ask you this. Let me ask you this point of question then. Mm -hmm, yeah. Where is your love now? Has your love changed? You know what? My, my love was conditioned before and I can now say, I know what unconditional love is. Where is your compassion now? It's, it's just change. Because I was, uh, I was very logical. I was very logical, very, uh, I'm so logical, but at the same time, I developed this empathetic understanding. So where is, is your, where is your joy? It's, it's within me. I create the joy. Do you I recognize create. joy in, in others? Um, I see a lot of misery in people, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, and for them, I can see it, but I, I see more misery with, with um, again, because I'm, I'm sensitive to that effect. Because sometimes I can, I can see somebody's pain. It's like okay. really weird for me to so say what is it. The, so what is your equanimity now? What is your sense of, of, of sameness? It's um, the equanimity. I mean, that's why this is something that the fact that I have experienced this, I don't want to lose it. And I don't think I can lose it because it is so, it's empowering. Because an, equ an, an equanimous mind, it brings you, it brings its power. When your mind is still, right? When you have an equanimous mind, it creates, it creates your environment for you. And people can begin and look at it and, and say, you know what? There's something about you. There's something different. You know, some people said that they see light. Some people said you just, you uncomfortable. Sometimes they say you uncomfortably too calm, right? And, um, and this is something that I, because I'm aware of it, so I, I create it. Okay. So now let me put this into this perspective now, into this context. What we have been talking about in these past number of weeks is developing a practice from the bottom up to be able to prepare ourselves to be able to have this top-down experience that Ed has related to us. So we're, we're, we're bringing ourselves from the bottom up. We're kind of intellectualizing certain things and so on and, and tuning in to our awareness of things. So we did that with our opening prayer. Our motivation was set. Then we go into the four thoughts to turn the mind to the Dharma. Why are we doing this? What is it that we are doing? And then comes the next step, which is the holy enlightened mind. Realizing this holy enlightened mind in its four characteristics, in its four vast and measurable qualities of loving kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity so that's the next part of the conversation that's where we go next week to see that because as we develop our meditation routine this is what we go through this is the routine that we go through very methodically until we can do it where we can just kind of maybe zoom through certain parts of it 
We're so stable in that we just move right through it very quickly. But we're mindful that that's what we're doing. And then we get to this next part and the doors that that begins to open. So this conversation has opened us up to this door of this of this spiritual experience that, that Ed has had. So then this next part will make it even more um, approachable for us when we see what are the four, um, four measurable qualities of this enlightened mind that we express as the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity that in Buddhism we call bodhicitta, the holy enlightened mind. And then there's more after that, it's more refinement. So I've used the example of that we're on this spiral path, going around in a circular direction. And we keep going around that same circle until we are able to um, rise up where we answer certain questions, where we open certain doors, and then we rise up to the next level of the spiral and the spiral gets tighter. And then we go up to the next level after that and the spiral gets even tighter. And then we go to the next level after that and so on. So for each of those spirals, each of those turns, there's practice. There's things to be able to tune into. And that's what we're, we're you know, at the base level, realizing this, and then committing to the idea that we can do this and that we want to we want to engage in this in this endeavor to be able to get to the to the epitome to the top whereas we become that light we become that buddha we become the christ we become jehovah whatever whatever name you might have for it we become that true essence of our of our nature So I hope that makes some sense. One thing I always try and do is to give a context of what it is that we're doing. Where are we in this context? What are we trying to do so that we can see that? This is a repeatable method. This is what the Buddha and the other teachers, but the Buddha especially, really taught us was this method, this system of being able to attain enlightenment. And, and once we attain enlightenment, to make it stable, that we become wholly enlightened beings as human beings. So anybody got any thoughts or questions? Okay, so then let me direct you now to the next page in our booklet that we have here, to page six, <clears throat> and to be able to draw your mindfulness to this. These are these three symbols, and I'm sorry, Ed, that you don't have this in front of you. Um, actually, did Michael put this in the chat? Um, yeah. Let me yes. see here. Michael put this in the chat so you can actually download it in the chat if you want and be able to. Um, I'll tell you what, Michael, can you screen share that? What can would you, you like screen shared? Page six that is in the uh, Four Thoughts of Turn the Mind to the Dharma. Sure, one moment. Thank you. You know, what's the definition of an educated person? Ed, Ed Jones, Jonesy, what do you think? I heard once that the purpose of a, a liberal education was to enable one to withstand change. Okay. That's not original, but. Well, 
Well, the answer I was looking at, an educated person knows how to reference material. Right, right. You know, so to go to the library. There it is. Okay. Can you can you zoom in on that? I know Michael does this stuff so well. Okay, so so now there's Om Ah Hum. So on the left side are the Tibetan characters that are the Om, the Ah, and the Hum. So typically the Om would be white in color. And the Ah in the center would be red in color. And the Hong would be blue in color. So the Om is the body, represents the body. And if you can see me, I'm bringing my hands together at my forehead and saying Om. This is the body of the Buddha the true nature, the bliss nature of the Buddhas. This is the chakra at the forehead. This is the body of the Buddha. Then the ah, the red ah is at the throat. This is the speech. This is the, the speech of emptiness. This is the unborn nature of the Buddhas. This is the chakra at the throat. This is the speech of the Buddha. So we bring our hands together at our throat. And then the hung, the blue hung, is at our heart center. And we say that this is the mind of the Buddha. This is our awareness. This is the wisdom mind of the Buddha. This is the chakra at the heart, the mind of the Buddha. So om ah hung, the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha. So this is uh, an important feature, this is an important mindfulness practice that we recite during when we enter into uh, our shrine room, when we are doing our practices, and at the end, when we are dedicating our practices, that om ah hong, the body, speech, and mind, may my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones including the Buddha, including the Christ, including uh, the, the, the Hindu Krishna and all the other great avatars that you can think of. So it's an important feature in our mindfulness. So you can close that now, please. So Om Ah Hong, the body, speech, and mind. This is why we do this. You've, you've seen us do it. We've, we've done it together many times. And this is why we're doing it, because we're bringing this all together. You know, we're bringing the body of the Buddha, the speech of the Buddha, and the mind of the Buddha all together so that we can melt with it, that we can become inseparable with it. It's developing that practice to be able to do that. So these chakras, in Buddhism, we concentrate on the chakra at the crown of the head, which is the forehead and the crown is, in Buddhism is taken to be the same thing. And then the throat is the second chakra. And then the heart center is the third chakra. And then the fourth is four inches below the navel. So we get into that in, in more advanced practices. But to know that there is a fourth chakra so and then there are there's a fifth chakra too which is at the secret place which are the genitals and that gets into a, a much more advanced practice so when we talked about the kundalini we talked about the seven chakras that included all those plus the chakra um at the below the anus and it also includes the third eye so here, the, the crown, in Buddhism, we talk about the crown and the third eye, the forehead, are one. But in the Hinduism, in the, uh, in the, um, in the um, Kundalini, they're separate. Here's one, the third eye is another, then comes the throat, then the heart, and so on like that. So just to let you know, 
that there is this system that is in place and it's built on 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 a great foundation and so on and that all this stuff is interconnected okay so i think we've uh, really explored this for tonight and maybe we should uh end this for tonight does anybody have any other discussion uh that you'd like to have right now any other questions or thoughts two two quick ones one do you know where what happened to rebecca is she left us permanently uh I, she hasn't ex said that she's leaving permanently but she did say that this round of 101 was going to be difficult for her to be able to attend regularly because of her commitment with her son i see okay so that you know she said that perhaps you know after this round she might be able to resume uh you know getting involved okay and i want to i want to ask gary a question um and i, I don't mean to extend us in, into the into the night but um G gary you referred to this 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 move that you said was not something you you wanted or were looking forward to or or, or resistant to but now you think it's the right thing i i wonder if your if your buddhist perspective uh ease the skids for you on that i mean it did yeah. uh along with my wife's legendary persuasive powers it, <laughs> you will uh, do this <laughs> uh and uh, I, I discovered uh, that uh, both my uh, son and daughter and uh, some of my friends and even curtis <laughs> thought it was the thing to do i think it, it's it, basically it's a better place of aging in place this place will have an elevator and while we're fine now uh you know uh this area is changing and the market is right and all of these things that just bore me to tears but moving as 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 most of you know is is one of the what's it five or six or however many most stressful things you can do in life yeah and you're getting rid of stuff and doing stuff so uh meditation does help as you're getting through the arguments that uh, well we have to throw that away no we can't throw that away and, you know all the stuff that goes with it is just I'll, I'll just be glad when the house is built it'll probably be winter time and we'll probably sell this house and live in my daughter's apartment for a while and i'm just right right now i'm just grumpy <laughs> grumpier than usual you all have known me for a long time but i'm <laughs> It's just that there's a lot of things you discover that you forgot you had when you're getting getting through this. But yeah, Buddhism does finding a place to center yourself outside or even in in walking through the forest at Burke Lake or someplace and finding a bench to sit on and just have 30 minutes where you don't just just a little bit of time and then you get back to the chaos of, of doing it. But uh, instead of uh, being seven minutes from the temple, I'll be 30 minutes from the temple, which is certainly doable, but. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else got anything? All right, well then let's leave it here for tonight. And, and I hope that you all, you know, reflect on some of this and uh, think about this and the things that we, discussed and uh as you all know this has been recorded and it'll be available if you want to review any of it on youtube so um uh, i think we uh we at the very least uh opened the door tonight i think it was very good and, and thank you very much ed j for your story and and uh and ed jones jonesy for you uh you know opening that door you know, it was uh, at your request that we went a little deeper into this, and I think it was very good. Thank you much. Thank you. All right, so Tom, will you uh, recite the uh, closing dedication prayers, and uh, we can. Certainly. Yeah, the lineage dedication prayer. 
Dorje Chang, Talopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, Dharma, Lord Gampopa, Pagmo, Drupa, and Lord Tri Kumpa. Please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessings of all the Kagyu Lamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all knowing state. And may all who travel on the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri the warrior realized the ultimate state, and as did Samatabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all the merits for all sentient beings. By the blessings of the Buddha who attained the three kayas, by the blessings of the truth, the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessings of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. The Dakorma prayer. By the virtues collected in the three times, by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate root of virtue. May I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Drikumpa Ratna Shri, who is omniscient, Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Dedication prayers by Lord Jitkun Sumgun. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, divine assemblies of Yidams, assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis, and Dakinis dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate root of virtue, not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth of the Shravatka or Pachaka Buddha. May all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, obstructors who harm, misleading Maras and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings through my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, ignorance, arrogance, and jealousy not rise in my mind. May attachments to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I in any case gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the bardo. Oh, Mahum. Oh, Mahum. Oh, Mahum. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable, the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightened ones for the benefit of all beings. Very good. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. Thank you, Lance.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, all. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome.